Uh, welcome to Building Better Cloud Detections by Hacking. This is the Azure edition of this talk. I did a talk, uh, and this is Ryan Nicholson, by the way. I did a talk a few months back, uh, very much the same, at least starts off the same, focused on AWS. So this is the second version of this talk, of course, focused on Azure attacks and how to de properly detect in an Azure environment some of these attacks, which we will discuss. All right. So again, my name is Ryan Nicholson. I'm owner of the very small company. It's myself and my wife, Blue Mountain Cyber. But more importantly, I'm an author and instructor for SANS, both SEC 488, where I'm the sole author, and also co-author with Sean McCullough. And I got to give Sean all the credit here. This was his brainchild, SEC 541, Cloud Security Attacker Techniques, Monitoring, and Threat Detection. Uh, so this talk actually aligns a lot with the material from SEC 541 and a little bit of the material in 488. Now, I admit this is a bit of a clickbaity kind of title, but it, it's certainly true, especially when we talk about how we can more properly build detections in our cloud accounts instead of just taking some commercial off the shelf information and trying to implement. Let's try to learn how attackers could be coming at us, how we can mimic that ourselves to be able to build proper detections in our cloud environment. So here's what we're looking at during this next hour. It's going to be action packed. Uh, I'm going to try to keep it to the hour, but no promises. I can really go on and on about this stuff. I'll try to be cognizant of my time because both my time and certainly yours is very valuable. We'll start off by talking about the detection building process. It's a very high level description of how we can build these detections in our cloud environment. And to be honest, this process works outside of cloud as well. Just, of course, the examples we'll be showing are going to be related to attackers coming at an Azure account and how we can identify them as quickly as possible, okay? Which means we're not necessarily gonna have to talk about logging, very necessary uh, to, to be able to detect these attacks. Because as you'll find out, and it's not just Azure, I'm not throwing stones, any cloud provider I've worked with in the past doesn't do the greatest job of logging by default, right? I wanna make that super clear. You, you can log a lot of stuff in your cloud environment to be able to build these detections, but out of the box, brand new accounts, you don't have a lot to go off of. You have to implement more rigorous, more intense logging. So we'll cover that as well. Of course, talk about some sample attacks, attacking the Azure management plane, uh, stealing and reusing credentials, how to identify those certain things as well. See what some of that log data will look like. And I will warn you ahead of time, there's a lot of JSON coming, a lot of JavaScript object notation, because whether you knew it or not, a lot of the vendor's log, raw log data is going to be in that format. So you also see some tools to slice and dice that information, that JSON information, before finally talking about building the detection. So basic agenda for the day, but we'll, repeating, we'll be repeating some of these phases throughout the talk. We'll see three different uh, uh, life cycle uh, iterations happening. And I'll talk about what I mean here in just a little bit on, on life cycles. But before I get into that, Huge, huge disclaimer here. Um, this talk, by the way, it, uh, I'm, and I'll talk about this more later on at the tail end. This is going to turn into a workshop uh, in June. So the second week of June, be on the lookout for a workshop related to this talk. Um, but whether you're attending the workshop or you intend on doing the things I'm about to talk about, please pay attention to this slide. Uh, because I'm going to be talking about attacking your own cloud stuff. Highly, highly do not recommend that you attack your production Azure account unless you have explicit consent from your security team and all the major players in the organization. Uh, because that could be as, jo as jokingly as this may seem, you, it may not be a joke in certain circumstances, could be a resume generating event, which means you broke a rule in the organization. It was an egregious enough violation that you could end up being fired for appearing to be an insider threat in the organization, right? You're doing things that you should not be doing as an internal employee. Now, I get it. There may be some penetration testers that that's your job. Your, your day job is to attack your own organization, converse with the security team to say, did you see me? Did, did you see this attack? And just improve the overall security posture of the organization. But if that's not you and you do not have that express written consent, do not attack production assets. It's highly recommended, though, to be able to do what I'm about to talk about is to create what I'm going to refer to as a sandbox Azure account, which simply is another dev account or just another Azure account, which does not have production data, production assets, 
you, you're mimicking production assets, don't get me wrong, but it's a, it's, it's a fake infrastructure that you're going to attack with the intention of building those detections, seeing what that log evidence would look like so you can build a, a proper detection to spot the adversary. Also, I will stress here though, if you're going to create, say, an additional subscription in your organizations as your tenant, again, get permission to do that. Otherwise, it begins to look like shadow IT, where it's people doing things they shouldn't be doing. Uh, maybe they're trying to evade some security controls or what have you. So at, at all costs, if I can't say it enough, please get permission from the organization before you start attacking anything, whether it's a sandbox account, set, set aside subscription, production account, what have you. Okay. So with that out of the way, let's talk about this process, this life cycle of building a detection. Now, if you look at this closely, this is super, super high level. Uh, we could probably go on for a day or two, something we do in SEC 541, talking about just, just one of these elements, right? So I'm going to keep it relatively high level, but you'll see this being worked through multiple times, talking about multiple techniques and ways to spot those attack techniques. So step one starts at the very top here, researching that attack technique, right? Figuring out how an attacker could come at your organization. You may be, may be fed this information from your, your threat intelligence team saying, hey, we're seeing an increase in these types of attacks against organizations like ours. Or maybe you're like me and regularly visit the MITRE attack matrix to see what techniques may be coming at my organization or organizations like mine. Um, can't have a talk without at least mentioning MITRE attack, right? So in any case, research what those real world attackers are doing. And once you have an understanding of how they're coming at your, in this case, cloud account, we want to make sure that we set up what I'm simply going to call proper logging. Now, proper logging, that's, that's really one of the ones we can really dig deeply into. But what I mean here is when the attack comes at the org attacker comes at the organization, what services are they interacting with? Are those services logging? And to what degree, to, to what level of detail could we identify that attacker's behavior in our environment? If we find blind spots, as you most likely will, when you have a fresh brand new account, fix that issue, right? Try to incorporate as much logging to capture that attacker behavior as you possibly can to, to build the proper detection later on. After you have a comfort that you've set up that logging properly, the third phase of this will be attack, right? Perform those techniques to make sure your logging is working properly, which feeds into the fourth phase, review the log data. Do you have what you need to be able to build finally that detection? Right? Are you able to spot the adversary? Can you sift through that data and find that attacker behavior to say, yes, this is an attack or no, this is not an attack. This is a benign action and so on. So that's the overall process that we'll be visiting over the next uh, handful of slides here, right? So we'll start with this first, uh, first discussion here, the first attack we're going to research. And actually we're gonna go a little bit uh, before that and learn about how Azure is accessed by legitimate humans as well as service accounts. This slide's littered with a bunch of information because Azure can be interacted with in a variety of ways. It's not just you opening up your web browser, logging into your Microsoft account, and boom, you have access to the Azure portal. That's, that's one way. That's actually the first attack we'll look at is an attacker trying to figure out your username and password to access your account as you. Tools. Command line tools, third-party applications can also access your Azure account. They're not likely to do it using username and password. They're more likely to perform that authentication using what Azure calls a service principle, where you create an application in Azure Active Directory, you give it credentials, you give it rights, and based upon the tenant ID, the client ID, and some kind of sensitive value, either a secret string or a certificate, that information is used to prove the identity by your third-party application or command line tool, right? To more or less, at the end of the day, get a token, right? To say, hey, here, Azure, I've proven myself previously. Here's my follow-on request. Here's what I want you to do. Here's my request to Azure, right? Some services, as we'll see later on, which is going to be one of our final attacks that we discuss, um, Azure services can use managed identities, which you assign an identity to a cloud resource itself. Well, that resource needs access to that credential information, that token. So we'll see how attackers can abuse that later on as well, right? At the end of the day, when I say tokens, I'm more or less talking about OAuth 2.0, which again is you proving yourself to Azure and receiving a token. That token is what the attacker is ultimately 
trying to acquire, to be you, to be that application, to be that managed identity, to take action inside of the Azure account. Okay. And some services worth mentioning here, thanks to uh, Alex Browlick. He was reviewing some of my slides uh, before this webcast. And he mentioned, hey, you might want to talk about, and Alex, by the way, he's another instructor of 541. Uh, he had mentioned, hey, you might want to talk about shared access signatures as well, or SaaS tokens. Another thing an attacker may go after, again, try to access some cloud resources in the Azure environment. So many, many ways to get access to Azure that we'll talk about here moving forward. So knowing how an attacker may access Azure, stealing tokens primarily, uh, or acquiring tokens, um, we got to make sure that we're logging these things properly. Now, when you stand up Azure, an Azure account, you have what, what they refer to as an Azure tenant, which means you have an instantiation of Azure Active Directory or Azure AD. This is one of those services that logging is on by default, right? That, that's fantastic. Now, there's some drawbacks, though. Uh, the logging, first of all, is inside the service itself. It's not being delivered anywhere unless you change that behavior. We'll get to that at the very end of this. And the data is only there for 30 days or, or a month, roughly. Okay. So that means that if the attack happened two months ago, do you have access to that sign-in information, that sign-in data, that attacker behavior? No, you don't. So to capture that data more long-term, you're going to set up what's called diagnostic settings. And you'll see this common theme throughout the discussion. We talk about turning on proper logging. Some services are not logging anything at all by default. And to enable logging, you're oftentimes going to visit the diagnostic settings section of that service resource, right? To, to turn on the logging and deliver it somewhere, whether it's Azure Storage or Azure Log Analytics Workspace, which is a built-in log collection and analysis service, which we'll see a little bit of here later on as well. But again, that's, that's a way to, to unblind yourself in certain situations. But as I mentioned, sign-in logs, let's say an attacker is attacking our, uh, our web portal. They're trying to act, they're trying to log in as us. They, they put in a username and a password, and maybe they're performing a password spray or a password guessing attack or credential stuffing or something. We should see evidence of that in some way in these sign-in logs, right? So with that said, let's move to the third step of this process. We'll, again, we'll go through this process three times. We'll talk about the attack, where the attacker or us, in this case, will attack realistic assets. Now, there's some tools that are purpose-built for this. There's plenty of attack tools out there, let's face it. But specifically for Azure and specifically trying to access Azure as a user to, to guess a password for a, a given user in an organization, there's a couple tools that I mentioned here at the very top. Um, they're actually both the same tool. They're just written in two different programming languages. And I've, I've heard it pronounced as MSOL spray before or MSOL spray, whatever you want to call it. It stands for Microsoft Online. Right, and it's performing a password spray against that uh, against Microsoft. Right, so I'm going to get to the rules of engagement here in a little bit. But at a high level, what it's doing is it's taking a file, which is a list of Azure usernames. So the attackers probably done their homework, or they have an educated guess of what all of your usernames may be in your organization, and they try a password spray where they just include one password and attempt that password for every single user account. Password sprays are becoming more commonplace due to lockout policies in organizations. In fact, Azure, they do have a lockout policy, but it's not like permaban, like you have with Microsoft Active Directory, the, the on-premise Active Directory, where you could set up a policy to say, free strikes, you're out. Like your account's locked permanently until an administrator unlocks you. Not necessarily the case in Azure. They do lock out your account, but it's for a fixed amount of time, whatever the the customer has uh, configured it to be. Uh, by default, I believe it's for 10 minutes. Uh, so after you fail 10 times in a row, you'll be locked out for 10 minutes, but then the attack can continue. So password sprays try to evade that, right? I'm trying exactly one password against all of the user accounts. If I'm successful, I'm successful. If I'm not, I might wait a little bit, try the next password, wait a little bit, try the next password, and so on. So with these tools and most of this slide is saying, hey, hey, pen testers, or hey, those that are actually testing this in your organization, be careful. I don't actually recommend it if you're going to be very noisy with this. Because if you look very closely at the rules of engagement from Azure, um, Azure and AWS and GCP all allow you to pen test blindly without pre-approvals for the most part. 
Um, unless you're doing adversary emulation, red team type stuff, then you have to, at least for Amazon request approval, but they do say these things are off limits in these rules of engagement. And one of them being, it's kind of a gray area here, but I'll explain. Performing automated testing of services that generates significant amount of traffic. These password spray tools, these very aggressive tools that are targeting Microsoft endpoints that could impact other customers could fall under that category. So just be careful. At the very least, if you want to be extra careful here, you just want to use it anyway, slow it down a bit. Slow down this tool so you're not overwhelming potentially a service that's impacting not just the target or your own company, but but other organizations as well that are using Microsoft. Good way to get your IP address or your organization blocked from accessing Azure when you start breaking these rules of engagement. Now, last but not least here, when in doubt, consult the vendor. Just say, hey vendor, here's what I wanna perform. I'm gonna run this tool. Are you okay with this? If not, is there, is there a mitigation here that we can work on together? Like how can I mimic this to, to, to generate this data and so on without breaking these rules of engagement, All right? So, so again, when in doubt, consult the vendor. All right, so with that disclaimer out of the way, I did it. I performed this spray. Now, I, I don't think I was overwhelming Microsoft because so, I only ran 12 users at a time, just 12, and then I waited a few more minutes, ran 12. So I'm sure that my 12 attempts that happened in about 12 seconds were not grinding Azure to a halt. At least I hope not. <laughs> I didn't get any emails from Azure saying or Microsoft saying, hey, stop what you're doing. But I just wanted to prove the point that these tools do in fact work. So this could be, again, a way to test these password sprays, even try to make sure it's successful, like put in your actual password to see what a successful password spray would look, look like. So you can build that detection as well. Build one for an unsuccessful password spray and one for a successful password spray. But as you can see here, I tried the password Sherlock. I chose that one because the theme in 541 is uh, Sherlock Holmes, so why not, right? I had a list of my users, so I did my homework. Well, I knew what my users were, of course, but an attacker may be on LinkedIn or on the company's webpage looking for some kind of list of users, maybe what the format of their email address may be, populate this list and try a password spray. So my 12 users, 11 of them failed, as you'll see in a little bit, but one was successful. And it was this poor Ryan user, right? This, this poor Ryanick at Sec 541 and change here was using the password Sherlock. So now me, the attacker, I have access to that account. I can, I can be Ryan in this case, right? So I'm in. Success Kid says that I'm in to the account. So the attack was successful in this case. So now let's move on to that fourth phase, reviewing the log data. Well, first of all, making sure we have the right log data on in the first place. And if so, can we spot the attack? Now, looking at this, now I, I very purposefully narrowed this down to the time window of my attack, but here's, uh, unless the attacker is coming from many different locations or they're spreading this attack out, maybe trying one attempt and then waiting several minutes, trying another attempt and so on, really slowing down, you may see this as your evidence for a password spread. Many, many attempts in a short amount of time coming from the same IP address many of them failing, hopefully all of them failing if it's an unsuccessful password spread. So to see this, I did a couple of things. One is I sorted, let me pull up my zoom it tool here. It wasn't on like I thought it was. So one of the things I did was uh, sorted in ascending order the date. It, it could be ascending or descending, but put it in some kind of order based on the date and timestamp. Because if you look very closely, you'll see that all of these attempts were happening just a second or so apart, right? Some happened on the same second, some were two seconds apart and so on, but lots and lots of attempts in a short time span, okay? That's the first thing that's a bit odd. Maybe it's the start of the workday and we had a flurry of users all logging in at the same time. We would know that, of course, when our workday begins, but that, that's seeming a bit odd already. But if we keep looking down the other columns here, um, looking at these user sign-ins, we'll see, a bunch of different users logging in. Again, this could be that scenario where everyone just gets back from lunch or just begins the workday, they're all logging back in. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll give it that. But look at the status off here to the right, right? The status is saying failure, 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 right? This column, all these failures. So that, that's a bit odd. So maybe everyone's coming into the office, but maybe everybody forgot their password. Not very likely, okay? And to add insult to injury here, that th this definitely looks like an attack. We have the IP address. Right, this IP address is the same over and over and over and over and over again. Now, what separates this from a unsuccessful password spray to a successful password spray? 
So if you look down the status column, one of them was successful. Again, it's in the same time period. Um, it's intermingled into the, these same, this, this list of users, and it's all coming from the same IP address. This looks like a successful password spray just by looking at this data. But again, all bets could be off here, at least using this approach, that the attacker slows this down quite a bit, like tries an attempt an hour where you have a bunch of successful logins intermingled in. So the analysis gets a little bit more tricky, but there are some automations that I'll talk about that help spot some of these for us as well. And some services that their sole purpose in life is looking for abnormal behavior in Azure, in your, in your identity services. More to come on that in just a little bit. All right, but let's say we still have our doubts. Maybe this Ryan user happened to log in from the same location for some reason around that time, and this is legitimate. We may have to look at Ryan's other logins in this environment to, to, to deconflict that, to see, okay, what's a normal request look like versus this request that's already beginning to look rather suspicious. So here we're trying to find some anomalies. First, we'll look at what we deem as a normal request from this Ryan user. So by digging into the sign-in information, one of the things you can key in on is the location. Where does Ryan normally log in from? Does he normally log in from that 180-something.ip address? No, it looks like every time Ryan's logged in, it's coming from this 107 IP, which geolocates to the town of Chambersburg, Pennsylvania. It's not where I actually live, but that's where my ISP happens to reside. All right, so that's, that's my normal login, but let's look at that abnormal sign-in request that we just found. Doesn't match the location. In fact, it's a different country altogether. It looks like it's coming from Frankfurt, according to the IP address, uh, because Microsoft's doing these GeoIP lookups for us. So that 185 IP address, already looking suspicious. Another thing we can key in on here, notice there's a device info tab. Based on the user agent string, because at the end of the day, everything's a web request when we're interaction, interacting with these cloud accounts, whether it's a sign-in or uh, manipulating a service or what have you, um, user agent strings are going to be sent along for the ride to indicate what tool we're using, what browser we're using, and so on. So back to the normal request. Oh, there we go. Uh, we have device info. It looks like I normally access this environment from some version of Chrome. Now, this may change as I'm updating my web browser, of course, but my normal operating system for this account is uh, Mac OS. Um, it's not a managed device and so on. So I'm getting that level of detail, but looking at the abnormal request, again, looks quite a bit different. In fact, it's not able to say what kind of device because this attack tool is not sending user agent strings that are being parsed by the, uh, the by Azure at all when it was generating and populating this sign-in information, right? So again, looking bogus more and more and more just by digging into this information. So we can build detections based upon this, right? Is it an abnormal request? Does it look like a flurry of failed logins and in the mix, a successful login and so on to identify that password spray? That's very manual, I admit. It's a lot of slicing and dicing of data that we would have to do, a lot of manual effort. So luckily there are some built-in options inside of Azure to help identify this for us. The first comes with Microsoft Sentinel, if you're using it, right? So if you're using Sentinel as your SIM in the cloud, your security information, an event management tool, or you're using it on top of your additional SIM, maybe set aside for that Azure specific data, they have what they call analytics built in. They're not on by default. You would have to enable them or generate your own analytics, but they can take two different forms. At the end of the day, an analytic is simply a Kusto query language search, which you configure, which so you set up the logic for it, or you use the logic provided by Microsoft, which there is one that we'll talk about here in a moment, and you enable it. You say, hey, if you if I get a hit, so let's say I get one hit at all, I'm going to generate an incident or an alert or what have you. So it can, as I was mentioning, there, there could be two different forms of these analytics. One, scheduled, which means run this every X number of minutes or hours or days. So run my query for me so I don't have to. And if there's a hit, if you match my logic, match my criteria, then boom, I'm going to have an alert or an incident generated inside of Sentinel. There's also near real time, which will, it's doing the same thing, but it's doing it every single minute. So if you want to catch the attack very aggressively, very quickly, you may want to set up a near real time rule. If you're okay waiting 15 minutes or an hour, you can go with the scheduled rule or what have you, right? And then of course the incident data will be populated in Sentinel, as I'd mentioned, and you can perform your investigation accordingly. And one of the analytics that I have that I'm showing you here on the screen in the screenshot is Password spray attack. Now, if I remember correctly, 
digging into the logic of this, what this is ultimately looking for is it's looking at your sign-in data. It's looking for 15 failed logins amongst a variety of accounts within 10 minutes. That's ultimately what that logic is looking at, very much what we just performed manually. So again, if I'm an attacker and I know this, I know this is what Sentinel is utilizing to identify a password spray, I'm going to try 14 times across 10 minutes, right? So it could be a, a bit of a cat and mouse game here, but I just want to stress that there are a variety of built-in analytics inside of the Azure platform, in this case, Sentinel, to spot some known malicious behaviors across your Azure account. And as that's generated, as I've mentioned, you can investigate further. And it's pointing out to me, once I scheduled and ran this analytic, or it ran it for me, that it found this 185.147 actor, again, was performing a password spray against this uh, account, right? So that, that's one example in Sentinel. Now there is a, a dedicated service that solely looks at abnormal identity behavior inside of Azure. It's another Defender product, Defender for Identity. So it's just another capability built into Azure that could look for this anomalous or strange behavior amongst your users. Okay, it's just another awesome automation that you can have enabled here. All right. Uh, moving on, uh, so the next technique that we'll research here, so that was logging into the Azure portal, right? Brute forcing your way in or more, more correctly, performing a password spray or a password guessing attack. But what about stolen tokens, right? At the end of the day, what you're getting once you've proven yourself is a JSON web token, a bearer token, as it's also referred to say with your subsequent requests, here is me, I've proven myself, here's the token, and here's the request that I want to make against the Azure platform. So what if the attacker just acquires those, right? They certainly can. And we'll see some approaches here, some attacks for that. So where do these, where, where could they be extracting these tokens from? One common file that you'll find on cloud engineer, cloud architect, cloud admin systems is the msal token cache.json file, the .json file. I missed that extension on the file name, apologize. Uh, but what that includes is either current or expired bearer tokens, as well as refresh tokens to recreate a fresh bearer token. So if an attacker has access to that file, they likely have all they need to either generate a new token or just lift the token from that file and use it with their subsequent requests right to it to Azure. So very dangerous file to, to have out there on the loose. So we'll see an example of that being stolen here momentarily. But these types of files do inadvertently get leaked to source code repositories or uh, these, these, these to this token information could be in a configuration file for an application that an attacker could stumble upon. So how do we see evidence of an attacker using these tokens, right? They, they, they no longer have to authenticate with Azure AD. Someone has done it for them. They're just using the spoils of that authentication, getting access to that bearer token. Here, we're going to look at a different service that could indicate for us usage of these bearer tokens, and it's the Azure Activity Logs component, which actually falls under the monitor service. Now, one drawback of using this service to identify what the attacker is performing is, yes, you will see when the attacker makes changes to your environment. Let's say that their whole purpose of getting access to your account is to spin up a crypto miner, right? So they're going to visit the virtual machine service with the stolen credential, spin up a virtual machine, start mining crypto until they get caught, of course, or maybe spin up containers or even spin up functions to mine cryptocurrency. But when they deploy things, that's going to be captured in activity logs. But what if the attacker is performing a discovery attack, which simply means I have access to credentials. Oftentimes, the first thing I'm going to do is see what I have access to. What storage accounts are available in this Azure account? What virtual machines are currently up and running? What functions have been deployed? And so on. Those are considered read actions. Those are not captured by deep, at all in the Azure activity log. Uh, whatsoever, right? It's CRUD without the R. So if you're familiar with the CRUD app operations, create, read, update, delete, the read is missing here. It's only changes, deletions, creations, and updates to resources that are in the activity logs. But not all hope is lost. Many service components like storage accounts, virtual machines, functions, and so on, have that diagnostics settings component or settings that you can enable to increase the verbosity, increase the logging that's happening, for those individual services. So that's that's there for you as well, if you would like to turn it on. So that's going beyond the defaults. Azure Activity Logs are there by default, but they're not telling the full story, right? We will we'll certainly have to do more. So let's talk about the attack now. 
How would the attacker possibly get access to these tokens and then how could they use them? So first of all, let's go with that scenario where some developer had inadvertently just pushed the wrong directory or the wrong file to some public facing repository, or in this case, a web server, right? Maybe some of that sensitive information found its way onto the web server. How could the attacker find that? Uh, an attack tool that's been around for years and years and years is a uh, Buster. There's a newer variant of an offshoot of that written in Go called GoBuster. I just find it a little bit more reliable. Um, I've, and only because me personally, I've run into some problems with it lately. It's not a bad tool at all. It's probably user error to be honest, but I've just migrated to, to GoBuster myself. But what that tool essentially does is here's, and it does more than this, but in this example, here's a list of possible files on this target that, I'm, that I want you to see if exist or not, right? Very simply, big list of files, endpoints, what have you, go to this URL and just add all of these to the end of the URL. If you get a hit, let me know, okay? So in this dir search.txt file, which I pulled from sec lists, it actually didn't include this msal token cache.json file. Um, I'm actually going to make a pull request, say here, add this. This is what Azure is now using. They have the older version of this file in that list. It's access tokens.json. That could be there too, though. But uh, by adding that to the list and then performing this uh, um, web crawl or uh, brute force or what have you, dictionary attack, whatever you want to call it against this web server, it does appear that I have a .azure slash msal token cache.json file on that web server. So this was the attacker again discovering that sensitive file in a place that it shouldn't be. So what's the attacker do with that? Once they've located the file, how could they use this to their advantage? Actually carry out the attack, pretend to be this, this end user. This is a bit of an eyesore, I admit. So let me explain what's going on here. A lot of command line interactions happening. But ultimately, at the end of the day, you may be using something like uh, Postman, you know, where you have that graphical user interface to say, inject my bearer token here, here's my REST API call, and so on. You could just as easily do this from the command line, though, and that's what I'm showing here. So the first thing the attacker is doing, this first PS line that's at the very top, I'll start uh, drawing arrows, right, is uh, they're just going out and grabbing the file. I'm using PowerShell in this example, but it could be anything, it could be curl, it could be Python, it could be whatever, right? So going out and grabbing that uh, msal token cache and saving it locally. Why? Because in the second command, uh, this JSON file has a lot going on in it. I'm trying to extract that token, right? So that's just a bunch of JQ command line kung fu. Kung fu. JQ is an awesome tool at slicing and dicing JSON data to extract exactly what you want. In this example, I'm trying to extract a bearer token, right? Just trust me on that. A lot of trial and error to make that JQ filter work, but that's in fact what it's doing. It's trying to locate the proper token value and saving it as a variable called token. And then the third command is really where the magic's happening. Once I have access to the token, I'm gonna to make a request to Azure to say, here, here's, here's me, I've proven myself, give me access to this component or tell me more about this component or whatever inside of Azure. And I'm simply sending a request to list the subscriptions in the Azure account. And it succeeded, right? It didn't come back saying invalid token or token expired. So I must have grabbed the right token and I'm getting information back from the subscription. So I can continue to carry on my attack until of course that token expires. But then again, in that MSAL token cache, I likely have refresh tokens. I can keep generating fresh tokens from here on out, right? Unless I'm found out and they uh, invalidate those refresh tokens and so on. But I may have sustained access in this account moving forward. So that's one way to attack realistic assets. So how do we detect all of this? Now, this was a multi-pronged attack that we were performing here. One was discovering that msal token cache.json file on that web server. So how do we detect that web crawl or that dictionary attack or what have you? So since this was an Apache web server, one place we could go, of course, is to the web server. They do, they do a general okay job of logging out of the box for Apache, Nginx, IIS, and those common web server uh, applications. Of course, we could be rolling this data up to our SIM or some central location and perform roughly the same search there. I'm just looking at the raw data here. So I'm run, really running two commands as the defender. Again, a lot more command line goodness here. So on this top one, I'm trying to extract out 404s, right? Because when you're running these web crawls, the vast majority of the responses you're going to get back from the web server 
unless you have a really, really good dictionary of, and it, it happens to be all legitimate files, they're all gonna say 404 file not found, right? So that's what I'm trying to extract here. Tell me in this access.log file, and there's some continued command line Kung Fu, but at a high level, in this file, who has generated, which client has generated the most 404 errors, right? Because that could mean that that IP address is launching some kind of web crawl, especially if you see a, a staggering number. Like right here, we're seeing this 203.0.113.42 IP address has generated 8,763 404 errors. That should be pretty abnormal unless we have a really broken website. Maybe our website is trying to tell the client to load a bunch of components that don't exist on this web server. Then yeah, we may see a bunch of 404 errors, but it's also it's pretty likely a, a, a web crawl, especially if we start digging into the data, which we do on the next line here. So we hyper-focus on this next search on this 203 IP address, again, in that access.log file, but we're trying to extract all of the non- because we're using egrep-v, try to say match the inverse of this. So if you see a line matching this, don't show it, but all the other lines show me. So we're focusing on, and this, there's a little bit of regex here, any three-digit number that either begins with four or five, which again is a, either a client error, so a 400 level error, or a server-side error, which begins with a five, followed by two more digits, only show me any leftover information. So again, it's coming from that 203 IP, but it's not a bad request, we'll say, or something happening on, on the server side that, that's broken, okay? And we do get some hits here. And one of these hits should be very concerning because we just learned that this MSAL token cache contains very sensitive values. And we're seeing a 200, so it actually wraps to the next line, we're seeing a 200 response code, which means to a web server saying, yep, I've got the file for you that you've requested, and here it is. So here's the attacker successfully getting access to what we believe is some sensitive Value. So we spotted that part of the attack, right? Let me, uh, I'm just highlighting some of the things I was already highlighting. <laughs> All right. So, so moving on, uh, we're going to look at one more attack here. And uh, this, is, this one's pretty interesting with cloud. And this is something that you probably haven't seen much at all on, on premise is credentials being fed to your virtual machines or being fed to functions, as we'll see a little bit later on, right? Because in cloud, you can uh, distribute managed identities, which we'll see in, in a little while, but also you could just, just have credentials on your virtual machines that are being stolen from these bad actors. So researching that attack technique, as you'll find, at least when it comes to the virtual machines housing credentials would be very similar on premise. But when we get into things like managed identities in Azure, that's where it gets wildly different. So we'll first start again by talking about, like, you know, whether it's tried and true methods, whether cloud or non-cloud, could an attacker be uh, trying to pull off here? First, of course, is social engineering and password guessing still alive and well. There could be configuration files or someone saving passwords.txt or something similar on that system, which again, contains that raw username and password information that attackers could be after. But in cloud, there's other methods that an attacker could get access to the file system of that virtual machine instead of having to break in or trick a user into giving, handing their credentials over to give access to that VM. Uh, one could be maybe these sensitive values are provided as part of what vendors call user data. User data is meant to be instructions that are run on that virtual machine when it's spun up in the cloud environment, right? So think some last minute build scripts is how I like to think of them. Like, oh, here virtual machine, uh, yes, we know uh, you've built yourself based upon this predetermined image, but I want you to run these final instructions like setting your host name or setting some IP information, maybe setting your root password to this and so on. There could be some sensitive information that an attacker could get access to even after that user data has already run. We'll see what that looks like in a little bit. But also in Azure, um, this is pretty neat. Um, it's a good, by the way, uh, ask me how I know. It's a good way to, oh no, I've forgotten my password. How can I still execute commands, maybe even reset my password on that remote system? is this component called Azure Run Commands. This is where the vendor, as long as you have access to Azure with the proper permissions, you can say, hey, vendor, execute this command as root, by the way, on my virtual machine. It will run it and provide you the results back, something an attacker may be targeting as well. So again, this doesn't even require the attacker to have shell access to your environment. All right, there's my little uh, the meme there. Where we're going, we don't need shells, because they don't. They may not need access at all to the virtual machine, like actually SSHing to it or uh, 
establishing a remote desktop. They could just say, hey, Azure, run this command on my behalf as the Azure user itself, not the virtual machine user. So we'll see what that looks like here. But first, how do we get proper logging of, say, the run command attack? The user is saying, here, Azure, run this command for me. Where do we see any evidence of that? You might think, well, we just talked about the Azure Activity Log. The Azure Activity Log is create, update, and delete actions. That sounds like we're creating something. We're saying, here, run this thing on my virtual machine. And you are correct. It will capture the fact that someone has launched a run command and what machine was targeted by that run command. But unfortunately, in the Azure Activity Log, you don't see the command or the output of the command in the log data at all, right? That's un very unfortunate. So where do I get that information? Or do can I even get it at all? You can, but you have to go to the remote system on which the command was run, okay? So for example, on Windows, it's buried pretty deeply under C packages, plugins, and so on. Uh, you can find the command. It's actually as a PowerShell script because that's what you're executing on Windows. It's my run command is here, run this PowerShell for me. And then the output of that command is in a dot .status file in, in the same directory. Well, actually not the same directory. It's a couple of directories up. On Linux, they do throw all this in the same directory. Although again, it's, it's buried pretty deep. At var lib wa agent run command download and then some job number starting with job zero and just increases by one each time. You'll see the script content, the, the bash uh, environment in most cases, uh, the standard out and any errors that may have occurred. So it's a dedicated standard error file. So that's where you find what the attacker was launching and what the re result was of that launch command. But what about user data access? How is an attacker getting access to user data? We'll see in a little bit, but where would we see that access? It's not easy, right? Because a lot of this just simply is not logged whatsoever, accessing the user data. So if, they're, if the attacker say abusing an application, maybe the application logs may show interactions with user data or the instance metadata service we'll talk about in just a little bit. Or if you're performing command line logging, maybe it's a Windows-based system and you turn on PowerShell logging, maybe you'll see those interactions from a compromised host trying to access its own user data to get that to, to, to get that information, right? So again, not all hope is lost, but it, it depends on how the attack's happening and what level of logging you're doing on the host side to be able to see that user data access. So let's see what these uh, interactions look like, the actual attack here. So first we'll begin with uh, getting access to user data. Now user data is accessible a couple different ways, and we'll see them here. Uh, we'll see from instance metadata service. That's a, that's a dedicated service per virtual machine that's deployed in your Azure account. All right, so each virtual machine has their own instance of instance metadata service that can be interacted with to learn more about that virtual machine or the cloud environment. And one of the things that can be acquired is this user data, these last minute instructions which execute on your system as it's being deployed or launched or what have you, right? Um, you can also use run commands on behalf of that system. So you don't have to be on the system to access IMDS. You can revert back to those run commands. So here, Azure, access instance metadata service for me in this web. Again, we'll see what all this looks like in a minute. Um, you can also use the Azure portal or you can just query the Azure API with stolen Azure credentials to get access to those user data values, that, that script. So here's an example of seeing that in the portal itself. In fact, they spell out very clearly, please don't use user data for storing anything sensitive because it's retrievable in those variety of ways in which I just mentioned. The portal makes it super easy. You just go to the virtual machine, go to the configuration section, view the user data in its plain text, right? Super easy. So if there was anything sensitive here, it would be completely visible in plain text, okay? But what about, we've got a compromised system. That's the top screenshot here. So if the host is compromised and that attacker wants to read the user data for the system, um, they can interact with that IMDS service that I've mentioned. So to get access to IMDS, it, it, this is again, for every virtual machine, there is a common IP address in which you're interacting with. It's 169.254.169.254. And it has a variety of paths depending on what information you're going after. So in this example, we're looking at metadata, instance, compute, right? So we're saying, I just I'm, I specifically want information about this virtual machine itself. And based on all that JSON information that's coming back, there's a dedicated field for user data. If you look closely, it's not the same content that we saw on the last slide. It's not that clear text. It's encoded. It's base64 encoded. 
So some may think, great, it's encrypted. You know, nobody can access this without having a key or something, but that's not what base 64 encoding is. It's just an encoding scheme. It can be decoded without a password very, very easily. And that's what the next command is performing here. It's base 64 dash D and we're feeding in that string. And then we see that raw contact, raw content. So it's just an extra step for the attacker. I've got my decoded user data, decode it. Then I see the raw uh, information. Now this looks concerning to me at least, because it is, this is that user data. And in this case, it's uh, setting the local root password. So now without being a root user, I have access to user data because any user on the system can interact with IMDS by default. And now I, now I can be root on this system if that password in fact is correct, if that user data successfully ran on the system. As I'd mentioned, you don't even need access to the compromised host to get access to its metadata information, like the user data info from above. You can just ask Azure, just like you did in the portal. You can do this from the command line as well. This was a little more cryptic. Here, I'm using a stolen uh, uh, token from this system, or I'm using the Azure CLI in this case, using the AZ REST command. I'm hitting a particular endpoint, which is the endpoint for my virtual machine. It's buried a, a bit deep down this rabbit hole at management.azure.com. But I'm saying here, I want information about this virtual machine and expand the user data values for me so I can see what they are. And once more, we have that information in base 64, we decode it, we get the same information here as well. So a variety of methods to get access to user data, uh, which again, could divulge sensitive information if we're not careful, right? And the last example of this, is uh, running the using those run commands yet again to try to extract sensitive information. In this example, we're getting access to the Etsy shadow file, just further proving my point that these commands do run as elevated users, whether they're in Windows or Linux, because standard users by default, as I hope that's how you're set up, do cannot read the Etsy shadow file because that includes salted passwords for every one of your local users that, that use a password, including root. Now, yes, the attacker would have to crack this password hash because again, it's a salted hash. It's not the actual password. But again, they got access to information they should not have access to via an unconventional means using the cloud environment to do its bidding for them. I didn't have to compromise this system. I didn't have to get shell access to this system. I just execute commands via my cloud-based access using my Azure credentials. As I hear Azure on this VM, run this command for me and report back the results, okay? So with all that, where's the evidence? And I let the cat out of the bag a little bit earlier. When it comes to IMDS and those REST API calls that are looking for user data, since A, they're read actions and B, IMDS isn't logged at all, we're not getting any data from the cloud vendor whatsoever. So that's again, where applications may, additional applications may need to be installed on the lookout for these things, uh, host base, uh, pools as well, looking for those web calls and such to be able to identify, oh no, IMDS is being interacted with, here's what that payload looks like, and so on. We just don't have that native capability inside of Azure. And again, with run commands, the activity log does show that the run command was executed, that a run command was executed against a virtual machine from this IP address. Uh, and here's some information about that user making the request, but we don't see what their script what content was and we don't see the output. That's again, where we have to go to the system. So the example that we just saw that run command being executed, looking for the uh, Etsy shadow file, we dig into this var lib wa agent run command download zero directory. You'll see that we do have those three files that I've mentioned previously, the script.sh, which is loaded on the system and then executed. We have the standard error if there were any, and then standard out if there were, was any output from the command. We see the script, that was run from the attacker was just simply cat Etsy shadow. We see this next example, there was no output following the command. So there was no standard error. And then the standard out is what was returned back to the attacker. And again, we see the content of that Etsy shadow file. So it looks like the attacker did make off with that information. So now I wanna look and see, is anyone escalating to root or trying to log into the system as root successfully, especially if it's from that same IP that we saw in the activity log, the one that executed the run command. And last but not least, we have managed identities, right? Another method to have cloud resources in this case, access Azure. We can provision managed identities to a variety of services, but two we'll talk about is virtual machines, 
and even Azure Functions. So how does the virtual machine and the Azure function get access to this credential information? How does it acquire its token to say, here, I wanna make a request to Azure and I've proven myself in some way. Virtual machines, again, will interact with IMDS, the instance metadata service, different endpoint, of course, to say, hey, I'd like to acquire my bearer token, please, so I can make subsequent requests to Azure. Attackers may be trying to leverage that too. Azure functions are a little bit different. Um, they all, they have an IMDS-like service, we'll say, um, but it's it's very random on how you access it. So, and you'll see what I mean in just a little bit. Uh, first, you have to look at environment variables inside of that running function. So good luck doing that. Uh, you'd have to compromise the function and be able to execute local commands or read its environment variables in some way. But once you do that, you're not getting the credentials. You're getting the endpoint where the, the credentials can be found from that function. So again, you have to access that from within the function, the running code itself. And also you have to send a randomized string as an HTTP header along with that request. Nothing you can pre-guess. So you have to compromise the function fully, get access to the environment variables and have the function on your behalf, make a web request to the proper endpoint with the proper values to retrieve the token. It's a bit of a dance, but it's possible. I'm not saying it's, not, it's impossible, but it's a lot of extra work, much more work than if I have a compromised virtual machine and I wanna get access to cloud credentials and it has a managed identity tied to it, it's just a single web request away to get access to that information. So what log data do we need to identify these activities? Once again, Azure AD sign-in logs, because not only are your human users who are logging into portals, you're seeing that sign-in information. When managed identities need token information, you'll see that evidence as well in the sign-in logs. We'll see that in a little bit. And then the activity log was after I've had access to that credential, what am I performing as that attacker moving forward, right? So again, uh, all of those non-read activities in Azure, as well as any additional diagnostic settings that we want to uh, enable on our cloud services to get that higher level of detail, right? If they're accessing storage, I want to turn on diagnostic settings for storage, virtual machines, functions, what have you, right? Get Include more log data. So here's the attack against virtual machines, then we'll see the, uh, manage, uh, the uh, managed identities on a function here in just a little bit. It's a real simple process. Step one is just get the credential. Step two is use the credential. So how do you get the credential? It's again, accessing IMDS. So it's that 169.254.169.254 IP address, just going to a different endpoint. We're going to metadata, identity, OAuth2, token, uh, and you may have noticed with these requests, you also have to send some get arguments like API version equals a valid version. That's that's what the rest of this is doing here. Uh, plus, you have to say what resource you're trying to access a token for, in this case, management.azure.com. I want to access the greater Azure environment. And if that's successful, boom, there's your access token. It should be valid for, for quite a while. So very, very straightforward. Again, if I compromise the system as an attacker, you simply visit that URL in the right way, you'll be given an access token if there's a managed identity attached to it. If there's not, there's no identity to steal at this point. But once you have that token, as per usual, just include that token with your subsequent requests until it expires. Then you just get a new one and, and continue on your merry way and then start uh, crafting those queries to the REST API endpoints inside of Azure. All right, there you go. Very straightforward. Now with functions, not as straightforward. Um, so two ways you could go about this. As I mentioned, you could completely take over a running function if it has a vul security vulnerability and you can inject yourself into that running environment that's serving that vulnerable code. Then certainly try to get access to the environment variables to lift two things. One, what they call the MSI underscore secret. That's that randomized value that will need to be passed along to the MSI underscore endpoint value, right? That's that URL location. If you can get access to that information and make that web request, you will be given the access token. Now, if the attacker already has Azure credentials, let's say they want to see if they can do more. Maybe they're limited. Maybe they can only manage the function service. They can create functions and so on. Well, maybe they can create their own attacker controlled function like you're seeing on the slide here. That's its sole purpose in life is to access that token information and display that as its output. Because maybe I have the rights to create this function and I have the rights to give it a man managed identity 
and I have the rights to assign a very permissive role to that managed identity, right? That could be a privilege escalation attempt in the making right there, okay? So again, once we have access to that, those environment variable informations, we just uh, access that URI and again, boom, there's our access token just found in a, a slightly different way, all right? So how do we detect all of this madness? Again, it's gonna sound a bit familiar here. Uh, lack of read only of this management plane, it really stings in this case, right? We're not able to see a lot of these interactions. We're gonna have to focus more closer to the host, closer to the cloud resource, like on virtual machines, look for new managed identities that maybe popped out out of nowhere. Maybe an attacker assigned that managed identity to a VM that they have control over to, again, try to escalate privileges or just look for strange patterns, right? Maybe that VM normally act, uses its managed identity to access cloud storage, but now all of a sudden it's doing a bunch of other wild things. So look at abnormal behaviors on um, what those managed identities are ultimately performing in your cloud environment. Same, good, same, same can be said with functions. Look for brand new functions that pop up out of nowhere, especially if there's managed identities attached to them. If those identities are being used, let's say in Azure AD sign-in logs, you see that identity being leveraged and you then you pivot to the activity log and see how it might be utilized in your environment. And again, those abnormalities could begin to stick out quite a bit here to try to detect this, uh, this, this very anomalous behavior, okay? So again, we kind of went round and round three different times. And there's many, many more where this came from when it comes to building your detections. And to be honest, I covered three detections in an hour. It does not take 20 minutes to build these detections in my experience. It takes several days, possibly several weeks to fine tune these things, get them right. Do, do the research of the attack technique takes some time. Making sure you have the right logging takes some time. Performing the attacks takes some time. Having ways to review that data, maybe even revisiting some previous phases, like, oh no, I'm lacking data. I gotta go enable more log sources or enrich my data in certain ways to make it easier to detect and so on. These do take some time, uh, take a lot of work, take a lot of fine tuning to remove false positives, increase the number of true positives and so on. So, but I just wanna give you a, a quick and dirty high level discussion of how we could begin to build some of these detections this time in your Azure environment. Right, so other than a couple more slides here that I'll go through pretty quickly, that's all I have. And we'll get to any Q&A that may have popped in. I see at least three things popped up, which I'll get to momentarily. Uh, but first, as I mentioned, a lot of this uh, stuff that we talked about here found its, it finds its way into SEC 541, the Cloud Security Attacker Techniques Monitoring and Detection course. So if this interests you and you want to learn a lot more, I mean, we go very deep in a lot of these areas, join us. I'm actually teaching this next week in San Diego at SecWest. Um, so not too late to sign up. So got some room in the course. Uh, Alex is also teaching this. I mentioned his name earlier. The following week in Singapore, again, if you're in that region of the world, that's closer by and you want to join us there, by all means. I get that these dates are kind of tight to plan travel and get approvals if your company is paying for it and so on. But just note that we teach this course at least monthly. I think that's how our schedule is laid out sometimes, as you can see, multiple times a month in some cases. And if you want to do this from the comfort of your own home, there's also an on-demand version of the course taught by uh, the, the God, we'll call him the godfather of this course, the one that, the one that started the whole thing, uh, Sean McCullough. So, um, and you could take it both if you really want. See, I've had some students that take it in person. They get that sans fire hose for the week, and then they can revisit the material working at their own pace by performing this on demand and actually get two instructors in the process right here. Here are different war stories and so on. So encourage you to attend if you want, if you wanna learn more about this, build a whole class around it. Um, I'll get to the Q and A in a second. Um, and I just wanna mention there's there's more SANS courses where that came from. I'd mentioned the other one that I uh, author, SEC 488, the Cloud Security Essentials course. There's many, many more depending on what specific uh, cloud security topic or knowledge that you want to gain that tends to be a course for you. I almost guarantee it. I think we have pretty good coverage of all things cloud security now in the curriculum. All right. So thanks. Um, and I'm going to get to the, the q and I know I've only got a minute here, um, but I'll stick around as long as the questions still come in. All right. Let's see. Can Defender for, be used? First question from Adam. Can Defender be used for spotting the spray in place of Sentinel? advanced hunt with KQL. Depends on what defender you're talking about. Uh, defender for identity, of course, is going to look for anomalous 
login behaviors, password sprays included, or logging in from new locations, maybe that user never logged in from before, or different platforms or applications that user might be using that they've never logged in with before and so on. But if you're talking about Defender for 365, if you wanna see those strange sign-in behaviors there as well, uh, the advanced hunt with KQL, certainly, right? You can look at a lot of those strange behaviors from your users there as well, even build the detection inside of that platform. So there's no short of capabilities in Azure. It's just finding the right one uh, for your detection, for your organization, and having it in place, of course, and paying the bill at the end of the month, because a lot of this stuff does come at a cost, but you're getting a lot of capability with that cost. All right, let's see. Uh, next was from an anonymous attendee. Log collection earlier in the presentation, you indicated Sentinel and Defender as two places to collect and detect. What are alternate op options? Exfil to other SIMs, such as QRadar, Splunk, et cetera, or is there some other way to trigger the detection? Exfil costs are high. Lots going on there. So in Azure proper, yes, Log Analytics Workspace is ultimately where the data is ending up to support things like Sentinel, Defender for Cloud, and so on. You could also send it to cloud storage and manually investigate or have a tool reach into that cloud storage, extract that data, and investigate as well. But there's also ways to stream this data to your SIM provider. There's a lot of capabilities and plugins with Splunk and QRadar and Elasticsearch and so on to get that data out of your cloud environment. But I agree, as you, so rule of thumb is if, generally speaking, of course, so there's some variance to this, but if the vendor has to process it, store it, or you are getting the data from the cloud environment over the network, to your own on-premise environment, you're gonna be paying for it in some way. So I agree. Yes, you may prefer to get this data into Splunk, but maybe it's not. Maybe it's cost prohibitive to get all of your cloud-based data to that platform. Maybe the costs are too high and you have to do analysis from some of these cloud tools. So very common question we have in SEC 541, but there's a lot of different capabilities, a lot of different options for you out there to use the data to the best of your ability, all right? Um, let's see, would the implementation from another anonymous user, and the rest are from anonymous users, unless I say otherwise, would the implementation of Honey Tokens as a form of detection mechanism differ in a cloud environment like Azure compared to an on-premise environment? Um, the approach is largely the same. I mean, the, the overall goal, I should say, is the same, where you put some fictitious information that an attacker may find appetizing, and you're just waiting for them to access it. If they access it, they made their presence known. Someone's accessing something they shouldn't in whatever environment. We got an early detection, right? We can now respond much more quickly than if we just wait until all of our data has been exfiltrated and it's months later, right? But how you go about it, yes, certainly could be different in cloud. A uh, Honey token, for example, could be that MSAL token cache file. Maybe we put that somewhere in our environment and to monitor that, is going to be different than say if it's on a file server on premise or if it's on a file server on premise we just do like local file system auditing look for any access attempts to that file and boom we've, we've made an alert based upon that log entry that might be generated but in cloud we might be looking for a specific api call that's being made maybe that api call is trying to request download of that file or that file is being accessed and we recognize that by turning on the appropriate diagnostic settings of cloud storage. And then maybe in Sentinel, we have an alert set up looking for any accesses to that file. Spoiler alert, something we might be doing in the workshop that's coming up in uh, just uh, uh, next month on the 8th. So look out, be on the lookout for June 8th. There's going to be a workshop which follows this, this, this webcast as well, where we're actually using those honey tokens. So great question um, in the spirit of our workshop. All right, navigating the amount of access I need to properly protect audit is difficult in my organization, least privilege for a junior analyst. Microsoft doesn't make it easy with the amount of roles. Any tips to manage this problem? Um, so it's, it's kind of a loaded question because I, I don't want to rip the vendor. I, I, I totally agree. There's a lot of different roles out there. They, they, to, to their credit, they are named pretty well, like storage access reader, for example. Like if I need access to data in Azure storage, I can create a, a role assignment to the storage that I need access to. But keeping track of all of those role assignments can be quite challenging as well as you're working towards least privilege. So I can see the hesitancy with organizations of just granting rights all over the place. It is hard to wrangle in any cloud environment, let alone Azure. So I don't have a really good tip 
to manage the problem other other than just being very, I, I, I honestly don't have an answer. I, I do not have an answer uh, to, to manage the problem of working towards least privilege and maybe being restricted out of some of your data, to be honest, because that, that sounds like an internal issue that needs to be worked out. Uh, maybe proving your point, saying, I, I can't do my job successfully. Look, I can't catch attackers without this level of access. I absolutely need it. But other than that, that's about the best I can give you. It's definitely a real, real problem, though. On the defender question from Alex. Okay, Alex is answering this. Uh, in Defender for Endpoint, you would only be able to see password spray directly against the device or from your on-premise AD if you forward those events. Thank you, Alex, for answering that more thoroughly than what I gave before. Awesome. All right. So any last minute questions before we conclude? Oh, there we go. Yeah, the attempt to answer is an issue I've been very patient with. Yeah. I'll, I'll try to stew on that a little bit. Maybe if you follow me on uh, LinkedIn or Twitter, or we have a we have a Discord for SANS as well. I'll actually ask Laura. If you don't mind posting the Discord uh, link in the chat in Zoom for everyone to have, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll try to stew on that a little bit, maybe talk with some other SANS instructors on how they may approach that situation and provide the answer there. Thank you, Laura. There we go. So yeah, as I mentioned, there is a cloud Discord, so don't be stranger, reach out, keep in touch. I also have my other contact information here. Um, I know typing emojis isn't the, the best thing in the world, but th that is legitimately an emoji in my LinkedIn link there. I do that for uh, keeping some of the marketing folks away from me because if they say, hey, uh, what is that? The, the hang 10 emoji, they, they don't know me. <laughs> you know, my name's Ryan. I'm not hang 10 emoji, which may appear to some bots and some automated tools to say, grab that as the first name and send out my spam message, right? So that, that is legit. So you can just search for Ryan Nicholson. Um, it's, the, it's the ugly picture you see here. Uh, that, that is me. Feel free to connect, stay in touch. Maybe we'll see you in a course in the future. But I'll quit rambling now. I've been doing so for over an hour. So hopefully you enjoyed the webcast. And once again, be on the lookout for the workshop. That's a companion to this webcast where we're going to be building some of these automations and detections, this time in an Azure environment. One we did two days ago was in AWS. We're going to have one very similar, but in Azure. All right, so look forward to seeing you attend that and uh, see you around. Have a, have a good day.